Hello everybody, it's me, Ghost Critic, and we're at the start of a brand new month. Which means, given that I've not been doing my weekly comic book reviews for quite some time now, it's time for me to look back at my October favourites. This was the pile of comics that I read all the way through October, everything that was on my pull list and some extras along the way. But out of all this, I'm going to pick my top favourite comics. And I want to emphasise favourite. These are not necessarily the best. These are the ones that I enjoyed the most, that I got the most out of. They might happen to be your best comics of um, the last month, but they are just the ones that made me feel like, wow, it's good to be a comic book reader right now. Now, it was quite... I didn't quite realise this until I started doing kind of my notes for this and what I was wanted to talk about about each comic, that I realised... These are all issue number ones, which is quite a feat in itself to say that an issue one, which is meant to be kind of like your setup comic, um, you know, introducing you to this new title, had such an effect on me that made me want to read more and more and more of it. And I hope all the comics that I have on my list go on to do much greater things that go on forever and ever and ever and be long running titles for uh, some time to come. So, let's see if you can guess before this video gets any further what those top five could be. I'll leave you for a second and I'll see you on the other side. My first favourite comic book of this of the <clears throat> My first favourite comic book of October is this thing, Headlopper. Now, whenever it did actually come out, because it does appear to be that we in the UK got it maybe a couple of weeks later, or maybe I didn't even notice this on the shelf when it was first on, but I'm glad I eventually found it because I loved this. It had everything right for me. Uh, it's kind of like this fantasy tale where we have our main character, um, which have, has all these nicknames, these titles, but he just wants to be called Norgal. Um, and this is what part of the book is, is so appealing to me, is that it has this element of humour going through it. Despite the fact there's kind of a lot of um, danger, action, mystery and horror going on throughout it, it's actually quite amusing at the same time. Um, it kicks off with our main character, Headlopper Norgal, who is um, trying to defeat a sea monster that is terrorising the shores of Castle Bay. And in um, inevitable style, a head is lopped off. Um, it's full of great imaginative characters, fun environments that I can't wait to see um, be developed and become, you know, more rich. Um, we have like witches' heads, we have bloodthirsty wolves, we've got dark sorcerers, we've got these kind of rock creatures and it's just so exciting and fun and the style that Mike Spicer has, has used, uh, which I think I said when I picked this up in my pull list video, it, it does have this kind of adventure time cartoon feel to it. It's very cartoony in style, very comic bookish, um, but it doesn't it doesn't make the comic any less um, fun or exciting or actually kind of mature. Um, I'm sure, apart from the kind of the head lopping stuff, you know. Kids could quite like this, you know, if they're um, a little bit more mature in years in the sense in, in there rather than height. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but it was just a fun read. Andrew McLean's writing this. He's got a good handle on the whole fantasy genre. Uh, the only disappointment about this is that it's a quarterly series. I'm only going to see this, what, four times a month? Four times a year? 
how can they do that to me? Um, it is a big thick comic and I'm sure I will go back um, before the next one is out time and time again just to, just to have fun and enjoy this once again. So despite that Marvel Secret Wars event hasn't actually finished yet and we don't know how our all new, all different universe is going to be created, Marvel are charging on with their new issue number ones in their new universe. And this guy finally gets his own solo title after for so long. Yes, he's had a few mini series here and here and there, but the actual ongoing series of what this I hope is, um, this is the start of it, and I'm very excited for so many reasons. I've always loved Doctor Strange as a character. Um, he works well in a group. He works so well singularly. I've read a lot of back issues, the kind of like the black and white reprint. So I have kind of got a back story uh, and kind of knowledge of the character. But Aaron quickly, right at the very beginning, gets over that introduction in the first page and gets straight into the action. And that is an astral plane fight with, you know, demons galore and this very exotic, erotic femme fatale. Um, and here we see, you know, Doctor Strange in full magic effect. There is no way around this that he is a magic user. Um, we have Chris Pacello on art making all the panels kind of bleed and meld into each other with these crazy panelling. Um, as much as I love Chris Pacello and I do, he is a great artist. He is one of my favourite of of all time, yes, I will say it. Um, there were moments in this that it got just a little bit overcomplicated and a bit chaotic, but I kind of let that go because it is Chris Pacello and he is such a great artist. Uh, we see not only Stephen in the kind of astral plane, but we see him uh, like just on the normal streets of, I think it's, is it New York or somewhere like that, a kind of suburb of it. Um, and we see how he sees the world um, with this kind of demons that only he can see and they could be like attached to you, they could be following you, they could be starting to attack you, but you and me, we can't see them. Um, only Stephen can. Um, and. The great thing about this book, it isn't just about Doctor Strange, Stephen. Um, Jason Aaron has managed to bring in lots of other magic users. So we see the likes of Scarlet Witch. We see um, Doctor Voodoo. We have the Shaman in there. And of course, there's a big bad evil on its way. There's a storm a-brewing. So hopefully we might see this kind of magical cabal coming together as, as a super team um, to fight against whatever is on its way that is scaring a bunch of demons who are running away from the big bad. Um, I love this a lot. I was waiting for this. This is one of my highlights of the new um, the new, all new, all different Marvel, and it didn't really let me down. Um, as I said, just a few kind of panels with Bacella's art being a little bit too crazy, but still a firm favourite for October. We move on to a kind of, I think it's a mini series, The Twilight Children, uh, written by uh, Gilbert Hernandez with art by Darwin Cook, colours by Dave Stewart. This is, above all, a gorgeous book to look at. It's Darwin Cook, it's gonna be good. Um, it's kind of another eerie tale from Vertigo. Vertigo putting out a lot of new issue ones at the moment. And this book focuses on this kind of quiet seaside village. Um, and it does, in this issue, it kind of introduces a lot of the characters that reside there. And each of them have their own kind of tragic, and it feels almost like a soap opera-esque background. Uh, you have the cheating wife. Uh, you have the drunk who lives on the beach, who, who may or may not have 
murdered, accidentally murdered his wife and children. Um, uh, you have all these characters and they all have backstories. Um, but the eeriness comes from all of a sudden this huge glowing ball of light just appearing um, just off the shore of this beach. Um, and it doesn't seem to disturb a great many people. This seems to have happened before. Um, it just kind of appears and then it disappears and nothing much more else happens. Um, but this time it gets a bit more real. Um, we have it um, disappearing and then reappearing in hotel rooms. Um, we find it appearing in a cave and unfortunately our inquisitive children on the beach just have to go and touch it, don't they? And they end up um, being blinded. Um, it's it, it ends kind of as it began with this kind of very mysterious, um, naked, uh, beautiful young lady who has obviously ties to this globe. Um, but again, it's kind of like that immersive story that you just kind of could be walking down this beach. You could be like searching through this cave. It had that feel to it that you kind of immersed yourself in this scenario and you could be right there. And, and as I said, coupled with Darwin Cook and Dave Stewart on Art and Colours, um, just a really gorgeous book. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to um, the next issue. Yes, it's another another Vertigo book. Um, Vertigo certainly are making a concerted effort right now to become relevant again. They had a lot of their big selling titles coming to an end. Final Issues, Hellblazer, Fables, so many other of their big titles. Um, and the number of titles they were putting out had dwindled massively. But there seems to be this huge new influx of titles of which Gail Simone's Clean Room is one of them. Now, last month also Survivors Club came out and that didn't quite manage to whet my appetite to read more of that. I was actually quite disappointed as much as I was excited to read it. So unfortunately for Survivors Club, I won't be picking that up anymore. But Clean Room, spot on. Uh, I believe this is Gail Simone's first Vertigo title. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure I've read that. Um, but um, that woman has certainly got some scary chops on her. She certainly has. Um, Clean Room kind of delivers this um, Grant Morrison-esque of nameless flavour. It is creepy. It is unnerving right from the very beginning where it kicks off all this craziness um, with a car accident which involves a child who um, gets run over. And uh, it kind of ends this prologue with the, the, the creepy line of why is Papa's face made of snakes? And you just know from then on, even though it's been kind of a bit crazy, a bit weird at the beginning, that that more weirdness is going to be coming our way. And we kind of move forward in time to uh, concentrate on what appears to be our main character, Chloe, who is this kind of investigative reporter. And she is attempting to um, get a meeting with the head of what sounds pretty much like a cult. Um, and her boyfriend or partner was part of this cult and eventually ended up killing himself. Um, so she's not happy, uh, as you can imagine, so she attempts to uh, meet the head of this cult, uh, a woman named Astrid Mueller. Um, and it just, like I said, it has this creepy horror, unnerving vibe to it. Um, the, the artwork by John Davis Hunt, uh, who also does the colouring on this as well, um, he's thrown in some kind of, not kind of, but certainly some um, very in-your-face horror cliches in a way, um, but when it's slapped there right on the page and the only way you're going to get away from that is to turn over the page. It's not like a movie where it's like a 
shock and then it moves off to the next scene. This is just there and some of it is quite... Uh, uh. So this is a very interesting idea that um, Gail Simone's writing here and I'm going to enjoy this one. I, I have no doubt on this. Um, there's some sort of mystery horror story going on and I'm up for more. Before we get to the last book of my favourite of October, I just wanted to give a shout out to five books that maybe didn't quite manage to make my favourites, but still were a good read and I just wanted to let you be aware of them. We're going to kick off with The Uncanny Avengers, issue number one, um, only because... I kind of want your guys' opinions on this because it's been a while since I've read an Avengers team book. Uh, yes, I'm picking up the last uh, volumes of New and Aveng uh, of Avengers from just before Secret Wars, but I hadn't been buying that as an ongoing title. I'm picking up the back issues. It wasn't, I think I've only picked up the volume after uh, Avengers Disassembled. And then they kept bringing them out as a number one and rebooting them or whatever. Uh, and I got a bit fed up of that. So I kind of picked this as the one to to read because, I, as I've said many a time, um, I'm only going to pick one Avenger book, one X-Men book. Um, that might change. I don't know yet. But I'm, I'm a little bit unsure. I have fun with this. Um, the artist on this statement, um, he seemed to have, I don't know, the legs on all the characters looked like they had rickets. Um, but it was fun. It's got Deadpool in. Nobody seems to like Deadpool being on the team. So you've got Spider-Man leaving straight away uh, before, you know, the team's even like kicked off. Um, and you've got Captain America, but the old version of him. It's all a bit confusing, but I'm going to keep going with it. Um, I really just want to know what everyone out there thought of it. Um, we have, um, please take children away from the, um, the TV screen if they're watching now. We have I Hate Fairyland. And all I'm going to say is, I know people have had a problem with this and hope it doesn't go the way I'm hoping it goes. But I'd be quite happy for every single issue for this young lady to be kicking the crap, shooting the crap uh, out of everything she um, in incurs along the way and her adventures while she gets out of Fairyland. I love this and I was surprised. Um, I've said before, Scott, a young artist, not my favourite. Um, kind of feel he's a one note wonder but this was one hell of a fun ride and if it just if it's just like this for however many issues this goes I'll be satisfied. Uh, Weird World number five yes this came to an end and what an end it was uh, it's just a shame that we're not going to see this character in the new series but fortunately we will have our same artist even if Jason Aaron isn't writing this um, the new series in the all new all different Marvel but this had plenty of action uh, a, a resolution of sorts even if our main character's journey has still a long way to go, but just brilliant. Uh, man things galore. Uh, we've got Morgan Le Fay on dragons. Um, oh, it was just action packed and I loved it. Um, I want to mention Island, um, issue number four, Brandon Graham's um, kind of magazine style comic book. Um, I actually thought this had a lot more stories in it than it actually did. It normally does have three um, separate stories in there. Uh, but the styles of art in this, as I was just flicking through it before I'd even read it, made me feel as though there was a lot more stories in here. But there is still only three. There is just so many good artists working on this book. Um, and the change in styles in some of the stories work well. They're not kind of jarring and they make sense why they are there. But um, just a great, great book. Um, there's, there's even a Brandon Graham story in here. I did feel with this was that it was... It's like, don't expect proper storylines. That's all I can say. This is more like in each book, because you've got one by Brandon Graham, and Brandon Graham is 
out there anyway. It's very difficult to follow a kind of linear storyline with him. It, it is more about being in the moment and just letting your consciousness drift on and see where it goes. But it was the same for the first story and in some respects the last one because I didn't have a clue what was going in the last one but it was a fun kind of anime manga style. Um, like I said there's a Brandon Graham story in the middle uh, and then this um, kind of um, Farrell Dalrymple story uh, and art that um, going back to one of his earlier works I don't know who he is probably shame on me for saying that but I, I, I realised this was a kind of story that had been born out of maybe another series but I was coming into it fresh uh, I got what he was doing with the story but it, again it wasn't so much a storyline as in a let's see what comes on the paper and we'll just go with it. But still, I enjoy Island. I'm still picking this up. Again, it's an expensive book. Um, it comes and it comes out once a month, obviously. Um, and there's plenty more pages for your book, so you can't complain. Um, finally, and I felt like this book needed some love, especially after the comments that I had in my last pull list video. Um, and that's They're Not Like Us. Eric Stevenson and um, Simon Gain on art, Jordi Belair on the gorgeous colours with phonographics on letters. Um, I have said, you know, that we don't know whether this book is an ongoing or it's a limited series. And we don't tend to know this from image books in general. Um, there's never like, this is an ongoing book or this is a 12 issue series. I think image just lets um, first, probably firstly, they let's see how well it sells because that is the bottom dollar. Something has got to sell for it to keep going. I mean, that's not just Image putting their business backing money into it, but also, you know, the creators. Um, and then if it is doing a, a well enough, I think they just leave it to the creators then to tell their story. And if that story keeps going and going and going, so be it. But if that creator only has a finite storyline to tell, then that is fine. But they don't let us know. And this is, I think, what the problem a lot of people are having with this, because at the moment, <coughs> apart from this issue, just before this issue, it did feel a little directionless. You were kind of like, right, we've been introduced to the characters, where they've lived has now burned down and they've moved on and they've got rid of their leader um, and they're making a fresh start. What is going to happen now? And nothing did seem to be happening. Um, and so I think that's what's stopping people from truly enjoying this book because I think it is a fun, uh, entertaining book that I still want to be reading and find out what happens. Um, and especially with this because, you know, something pretty exciting and pretty crucial happens. Um, not only is it the fact that one of the characters we've not seen for a while turns back up and probably has a lot of bad things lined up for our team, but we also get a kind of new gang of kids with clearly powers, uh, much like our regular crew here, as they go out um, to have fun in a, in a nightclub and find themselves not taken, not kidnapped, hostage, um, taken prisoner by this this other gang and it all looks like um, the proverbial is going to hit the fan. Um, I really enjoyed this issue. It was a pickup. Something happened. Something pushed through. There's a lot of talking in this. It's a talky talky book but you know I know comics are very much a visual product but you know you gotta have some words in there to read at the same time. And they are my books that didn't quite make it, but I just wanted to share with you. And finally, for my favourites, my top five favourites of October, Brian K. Vaughan's new number one, Paper Girls. Um, there's something going on at Image at the moment. I don't know whether there's this 80s retro vibe going on. Um, we've got Deadly Class. We've got Plutonia and now we've got Paper Girls firmly stuck 
in the kind of 1980s era, which I'm happy about because that's kind of when I grew up in my teenage years. Yes, I'm that old. Um, but this book thoroughly surprised me. Um, I was unsure whether to pick it up to begin with, but I thought, what the hell? I don't know whether it was a quiet week or maybe the lure of this book just draw, drew me in and I had to have a go with it. But I'm glad I did because it's another one that I just thought, oh, when I started reading it, despite the kind of dream sequence at the beginning, which was kind of a bit spooky and scary, I thought this was generally going to be set up as a kind of slice of life story. Um, you have these four girls they're all pa they're all kind of I want to call them paper boys but they're paper girls um, delivering your morning paper at a ridiculous o'clock in the morning um, and you have this one one girl Erin um, I think this is her first run and she meets the three others and there's a kind of a bit of banter and there's obviously a hard girl there and she's the leader and she's tough and she's not sure about Erin about bringing her into the fold and all this. And I just thought, well, this is pleasant, you know, it's nice. And with Cliff Chang's artwork on there, with its kind of pastel-y, Halloween-y glow to it because this is set the day after Halloween, um, I'm fine with this. I'm enjoying reading this. And then Brian K. Vaughan throws in these weird, hooded, bandaged characters that have stolen off with one of the girls' walkie-talkies. And so the girls go off, try and find them, only to find this hideously deformed creature that looks almost human. And despite the fact that these creatures get away, they dropped something. What is they dropped? looks very much like a Apple product. Um, not an iPod, maybe an iPad, not an iPad, another, but it was certainly an Apple product. So you've kind of got this back to the future vibe. I don't know. Um, <coughs> it, it now just kind of turned it on its head and it, it suddenly becomes this, this almost sci-fi type series. Uh, and that just hooked me. I'm like, where did that come from? That was a great drop. I didn't expect this. I just expected some kind of, oh, it's the night after Halloween. These girls trying to get through their life as paper girls. It's going to be okay. But it's Brian K. Vaughan, so it's going to be great. And it was. Uh, as I said, Cliff Chang's artwork with uh, Matt Wilson on colours. Um, every page kind of had this muted pastel um, dusky, well it's not dusky because it's the opposite, it's kind of dawn type colours um, as, as they prepare at four or five o'clock in the morning to um, deliver their papers. They just look gorgeous. Um, so obviously this has gone on my pull list. And that's it for this month. Thank you very much for making it to the end of this video. All your views, your thumbs up, your comments down below are much appreciated. Um, until next month when I'll have read another huge stack of comics and I'll pick out again my top five of November. Bye bye.